الحمد لله وكفى والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى أما بعد فعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم والذين جاهدوا فينا لنهدي أنهم سبرنا فقال الله تعالى في مقام آخر قل للمؤمنين يغضوا من أبصارهم سبحان ربك رب العزة أما يسفون والسلام على المرسلين الحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد وبارك وسلم اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد وبارك وسلم اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد وبارك وسلم so <coughs> I apologize there seems to be some um, technical difficulties inshallah we'll move forward and uh, everyone will be able to at least catch the recording later. Now, before I begin, one of the things I want to mention is that <clears throat> this uh, webinar is a little... Um, when I got the topic, I was a little... I, I knew it was something that we need to cover. As a community, we need to cover. At the same time, I was looking at our mashayikh, and our mashayikh do speak about this, yet they are careful when speaking about it. So I want to make the following request. If this does not affect you, meaning if it's not affecting you in your role in life or not affecting you directly, or is it something that's never crossed your attention or mind, then you might consider not sitting in the program. And the reason for this is because sometimes the introduction of a thought, despite the fact uh, that there may not be any malicious intent behind it, can be harmful and detrimental spiritually. Sometimes, the introduction of a thought, despite the fact that there's no malicious or uh, intent behind it, can be harmful and detrimental. That's just the nature of our lives. Our heart is like a container. Anything you put within the container will forever remain that container until the container is removed. Or the container is cleaned, excuse me. And so... One of the fears of speaking about such a topic is that someone may never have had an inclination towards this. And then they've heard, they hear the presentation and then all of a sudden they, all of a sudden they um, have an, a new inclination because that thought was put into their mind. I'll give an example. If there's an attractive woman, since I'm a male, if there's an attractive woman and she's walking outside i will never have <clears throat> i will never have the what's the word i'm looking for i'll never have the inclination or desire or temptation to look at her and the reason is very simple the reason is because i don't know she's there if she's outside and i i'm inside and right now not only my inside i'm inside my room and i'm inside the room i'm actually sitting inside my closet because I want to stay away from as many people as possible right now while giving this presentation. And so from where I'm sitting, there's no door. I mean, there is a door to the closet. But there's no door outside to the real world. And on top of that, there's no opportunity for me to see, look outside of a window. And then I can't see what's going on over there. What results? I'm never going to be attracted to that person. And since I'm not going to be attracted to that person, then I'm not going to ever have the temptation to have to worry about it. One of the problems with this argument that people try to pose is that, look, brother, we're living in a day and age that if you're using the Internet and you're losing, using electronics, then you're naturally going to stumble upon these type of things. And these types of things will always exist. And you cannot, you, cannot, you know, um, protect yourself to such an extent that you don't even want to hear about it. So again, I'm not making this fard or lazim upon anyone. This is something I'm mentioning. That if it's not necessary for you to hear it, then you might not want to hear it. And if you feel it is necessary, then go ahead and hear it. I'm not going to stop anyone. I can't see anyone here. In fact, I'm sitting in my closet and I can't even see my, my wife or kids who are outside the closet. That's really up to you. This is not a for this is not there's no compulsion in this. You can do as you decide, but that's just one thing I wanted to mention. The second thing is I don't really recommend people reading too much about this. Now, why is that? The reason for that is, if a person reads about this, then they get a lot of thoughts that come to mind. 
you know, they're very good books about pornography and the harms that it causes, etc. And when you read those books, it brings up some very disgusting realities. And until those realities uh, are, you're exposed to those realities, what happens is that you begin to, you, you've never had any exposure to it, and you've never really had any thought about those realities. But once those realities seep into your subconscious, Shaitan can play with it. So um, I'm presenting on it. If you want to sit through the presentation, you're more than welcome. And if you want to listen, you're more than welcome. And look at the, the, the slides, you're more than welcome. But I don't really recommend going out and reading about it unless you really have to. And there's a beautiful hadith of the Prophet where he mentions, مِنْ حُسْنِ الْإِسْلَامِ الْمَرْءِ تَرْكُهُ مَا لَا يَعْنِيهِ From the beautification of the religion of an individual is that he uh, leaves that which doesn't concern him. So Islam is perfect and beautiful. And unlike other things in our world, in our lives, like a car, a house, etc., to beautify it, what do you do? You add things. You add wallpaper, you add paint, you add rims, you add tints, you add this, you add that. But for Islam, that the faith was already perfected on that day. Thus, we don't have to try to beautify it more through things outside of the deen and through things that don't concern us. So actually, you see people sometimes, they get caught up on thing, with things that are very extra in their lives. So they might be exposed, for example, to the news, and they're thinking to themselves, well, I have to watch the news, because if I don't watch the news, I won't know what's going on in the world. The news, a certain amount of news is necessary to exist. And a certain amount of news after that is just absolute, um, it's absolutely unnecessary. And it's really just fulfilling a desire of the nafs to want to know more, know more, know more. And the nafs is like that. When you're driving by when there's a car accident and you're late and everyone's slowing down because they're rubbernecking and they're all looking at the accident, we're getting so upset with those people. But when it's our turn to pass that accident, despite the fact that we're upset with the 20 people ahead of us who are, who are all looking across to see what happened to the accident, we're also pressing the brakes, slowing down and trying to see what's going on there as well. Why? It's the nafs' nature to want to know more, to want to desire more, to want to um, explore more. So after this presentation, unless it's necessary, don't go and look at other things. In fact, I've noticed in myself that a lot of these thoughts that now are in my mind, they're there during prayer, etc. Just, you know, these statistics and everything. I have to sit and do some, you know, good amount of muraqaba and zikr to try to get it out, which is okay. I'm not upset. I'm not blaming the organizers or anything. But the reality is that some of these things are not necessary. They can plague you sometimes. And so even if you sit through the presentation, if you don't need to research more, don't research more. I remember as I was going through this entire um, presentation, I was looking at what are many of these terms, what do they mean? I began to research them. Definitions, they also stick in your mind. So just be a little um, careful. The last disclaimer, I'm going to spend like an hour on disclaimers, is that an individual who is young may not want to sit. I'm going to try to keep this as PG as possible. I'm going to try to keep it as um, clean as possible. I'm going to keep it as appropriate as possible. However, there will be some terms used here and there that um, might not be appropriate for everyone. So parents, you might have to sit through this so you know what to do about friends, colleagues, maybe yourselves, maybe your children. High school youth and college youth, you might definitely have to sit through it. Upper junior high youth, you might have to sit through it. Elementary school kids, I don't know if this is really the presentation for you. I know definitely there are elementary school children who are affected by this. I definitely know this firsthand. But it might not be for every elementary school student. So the, the topic begins pornography, addiction, the effects and remedies. And this is exactly what I'm going to try to stick to when presenting about this. There's going to be a bit of a historical discussion of pornography, a bit of a linguistic discussion because my background is in English and education. And um, then we're going to begin to speak about the effects, the actual effects in society, and then the spiritual effects as well. I try to stay away from too many statistics. You will find some statistics here and there. I try to stay away from statistics because they're really depressing. They're really depressing. Uh, but at the same time, there's some statistics that are absolutely necessary to know. And so you'll see some thrown here and there. If you want some more statistics, you can always contact me. I can send you quite a few statistics um, about this entire um, presentation.
Now, when we look at uh, anything, I always like to look at definitions. And when you're looking at definitions within uh, the English language, you always want to look at the Oxford English, English Dictionary. And the Oxford, Oxford English Dictionary is the um, premier and absolute authority of English. So don't, I mean, everyone uses Merriam-Webster, everyone uses um, American Heritage Dictionary, uh, everyone uses Wikipedia, but that's not the case. You really want to use the OED. The OED will give you uh, the actual definition and it'll begin to give you roots and it'll actually give you usages of the words as well. And those usages are actually very important because you see how a word was used before and how it's used later. And the words that an individual uses, the words that are present within a society are a direct indication of how that society is. Now, I have two categories here, and, and I try to edit as much as I can. If you find errors, just let me know. My apologies in advance. I have definition A and definition P. Definition P refers to pornography. De definition A refers to addiction. So definition 1P, the first definition of pornography, and I'll read this directly, is the explicit description or exhibition of um, intimate, um, or I guess just saying the term clearly sexual subjects or activity in literature, painting, films, etc., in a manner intended to stimulate rather than showing aesthetics. Okay, So it's supposed to show that which is intimate, It's supposed to show that which is intimate <clears throat> and the purpose of it is to stimulate rather than show aesthetics. And that's going to be an important differentiation because we see in the 1800s and the Victorian period that there was sort of a, a, a switch over here between the intent of certain, certain uh, displays that have occurred historically. And some of us have gone to museums and we've gone to uh, the Museum of Science and Industry or the Field Museum or, uh, you know, the, the, art, the, the, the art museums that are out there. We see sometimes displays and they're historical in context, but they're sort of inappropriate. So we don't want our children, we ourselves feel uncomfortable looking at it as well. But the, the purpose might not have been to stimulate. It might have just been to show aesthetics. The second definition is the explicit description or depiction of violence in a manner to in, uh, intended to stimulate or excite. So the second definition doesn't even deal with the intimate aspect of it. Whereas the first, def uh, uh, the first definition actually deals with the intimate uh, aspect, the second one deals with the violent aspect. And that's going to be extremely integral within our discussion because we will begin to see how does the first definition exists separately today. How does the second definition exist separately today? And how have the two merged together? So now we've established that pornography, it's going to be something visual in most cases. It can also be oral, A-U-R-A-L. It can be from the ear. You can be able to listen to it. Um, that's going to be of a nature to excite and arouse uh, towards intimacy. And then the other is that it's going to be the use of some sort of media to be able to excite um, through violence. Now, the definition of addiction is the state or condition of being dedicated or devoted to a thing. Okay, so it's the, there's a devotion to a thing such that you cross that moderate, you know, uh, that moderate little realm. Everyone has a certain realm that the, in which they exist, and you can be devoted within a realm. And once you pass that realm, that becomes an addiction. And it's very interesting today that we see people go beyond um, that realm in various areas, within eating, within drinking, within clothes, within money, within people as well. Within, uh, you know, there's some people who say, I cannot move out of Chicago no matter what I do. I've heard this from people. We cannot leave here. It's not good. This is the only place I'll live. It's a type of addiction. Now, it's a devotion to a, a central topic. Something about the city uh, uh, appeals to them. But then they take it to such uh, an extent where, you know, the husband or the wife, whoever it may be, the, the provider finds a job outside the city and says, you know what, now I can't leave. And it becomes very strange and it becomes a bit creepy. So this is what addiction is. The second idea of addiction is the immoderate or, or compulsive consumption of a drug or other substance. Okay. Now, when we speak about substance, 
it, ref it refers to something beyond drugs as well as we're going to get into shortly, especially a condition characterized by regular or poorly controlled use of psychoactive substance, despite adverse physical, psychological, social consequences, often with development uh, um, of psychological tolerance and withdrawal symptoms, etc. Now, so now in the first definition, we've d defined this idea of devotion, dedication that goes beyond the norm and goes beyond the medium, beyond the balance approach. <clears throat> the Prophet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned like that, that verily, <clears throat> likewise, we have made you a middle ummah. This ummah was established to be in between. We are neither غير المغبوب عليهم uh, not, not, not the ones who became overly uh, re, uh, we didn't become the recipients of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's anger through overly uh, um, indulging ourselves in, in only that which is hardline according to the rules and not uh, with any feeling you know only with the fiqh and this is what the khawarij did right the khawarij are those people who, you know, there's a debate upon their place in the plane of Islam, but they became too fixated upon the actual physical rites of Islam, the rituals of Islam, and they did not involve themselves within the spiritual. What a ballin, nor those who became astray, overly involved in the spiritual, overly involved in that which uh, uh, refers to, uh, to love, and um, we're not that way either, where we just begin to devote ourselves to the, the spiritual elements. Oh, I'm praying in my heart, and I'm praying 24-7, so I don't need to stand up and physically pray. Or oh, I'm fasting in my heart. We don't involve ourselves in that extreme either. And there are people who do that today. There are people who do that today. And then one of the interpretations according to the Mufassirun refers to the Maghdub Yadayim, are the Jews. Walin uh, are the, 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 the Christians. And so we are ummatan wasata, we are the people who receive the scripture who fall between these two extremes as well. And then it's also the second definition refers to the, the comp compulsive consumption of something despite a person leaving the medium. Now, there's an interesting little factoid I mentioned on the bottom that children, now it's actually younger, it's around 10 years old, are exposed. Some stats say eight to nine years old, children are exposed to pornography. They're online. And they're exposed very early on. My first exposure was early high school, uh, uh, I think ninth grade, because I mistyped the word hotmail.com. Hotmail, H-O-T-M-A-I-L. Just quickly typing, I typed H-O-T-M-I-A-L.com. And I mentioned this because I was in the school um, computer lab during class, and something inappropriate popped up right away. And so... Uh, the schools were not ready to handle this when we were younger. It just popped up right away. And the schools today have better protection. But even then, there's an entire idea of what is pornography and how that doesn't really balance with the Islamic perspective of pornography. So things can pop up and a person can become exposed to it. And that exposure can lead to a very dark path and alley. And subsequently, cause them to fall into a rut that they never want to be a part of. Um, there are statistics that are mentioning now that, that 80 to 90 percent of students will have viewed pornography by the time they leave high school. The newer statistics that are being, uh, being uh, sort of pushed by many of these Christian groups have been mentioning that almost 100 percent of high school students who graduate when they're dealing with homework will have been exposed to pornography. And so I only mentioned my specific example within school because that's exactly where I had that first exposure. And Alhamdulillah, Allah Ta'ala did not allow me to, you know, I didn't have to go down a path to pull myself out. Allah Ta'ala sort of cut it off over there. But sometimes people, that first exposure leads to a second, leads to a third, leads to a fourth, and they go down a very, very dark alley. <clears throat> now, if we go away from the idea of um of uh, of definitions and we go to the actual root words it presents us with another uh, with with something else and that is that from the mid 16th century the word um a, a, a addict came from um uh, the 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 idea to be assigned and to be devoted to someone to be bound or to be de devoted and that's what addiction really referred to 
So there's a concept, there's a person, and it meant to be devoted to them. Now, if you look at this idea, it hasn't really deviated in its current definition. We still look at a devotion to be a, a de addiction to be a type of devotion. Someone says I'm addicted to drugs. They're devoted to that drug. There's a type of devotion. They will not leave it. If you look at a husband, if you look at a wife, and the wife marries a husband who's very uh, practicing and very handsome, etc., and then he begins to lose his beauty or lose his uh, devotion to the deen, but she said, I'm not going to leave him. People will say, well, you're crazy, but she'll think I'm just devoted to my spouse. I'm devoted to my husband. Same applies for the, uh, the, the, the husband towards the wife, etc. So this idea has remained relatively consistent. But if you look at the other term, pornography, and its uh, root, it's actually very different. It's actually very different. Now, it's very different for, for, for people who are not Muslim. From the Islamic perspective, it's very much the same. There's interesting statistics here while I'm speaking. You can take a look at them. I'm not going to really be talking about them right now. That refers to how por por pornography addiction and the facts that, 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 that refer back to it. Interestingly enough, the, the, the state that consumes the most pornography is uh, Utah. And there is some correlation between a person's devotion to religion and the first exposure that is discussed in this in this presentation. The, 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 the city that has the most addiction is Elmhurst, Illinois. So those of you living in Chicago, it's a suburb uh, of Chicago that has the, the, the most uh, sites or, or views of uh, pornographic material online. Go to the next one. <clears throat> now, in the mid-19th century, in the 1800s, <clears throat> we begin to see what? This term of pornography. Pornography actually comes <clears throat> from the root to study or write about prostitutes. To study or to write about prostitutes or prostitution. Now, if you were to mention that today, people would be very, very offended. But let's take a moment to answer the following question. What is a prostitute? A prostitute is someone who he or she decides to sell or for the sake, the return of money, uh, involve himself or herself in intimate actions. So for the return of money involves himself or herself in intimate actions. That's what a prostitute is. Pornography is really a group of individuals for the sake of some return and return of gain. For those who are being paid for it, it's actual wealth. For those who make it about themselves and then they expose it online, that is for the exchange of the wealth of fame and popularity, such that C-list celebrities now make it to the red carpet and are now listed next to A-list celebrities, even though the way they have reached fame is through some of the most disgusting and deplorable acts, but they still reach that level. So if you look at the idea of what pornography is, it's studying or writing about prostitution. People don't want to look at it that way. People want to look at it as what? Oh, this is not about prostitution. This is not about um, this is not about um, um, about such an act. This is about expression and art. It's not about expression and art. Language is very telling when it comes to the place of people today. If you look at the language in the, my wife is a, a licensed marital and family therapist, and I think it's called the DSM. Um, they have a there's an authoritative text that diagnoses illnesses. The illnesses in part three are not the same illnesses that exist in part four. Some are no longer accepted as uh, psychological ailments and illnesses. Rather, they're looked at as what? Just a normal activity. The literature from that period of time, the mid 1900s, uh, the mid to a little beyond the mid 1900s, states something to be an illness. Closer to the year 2000 or into the 2000s now, it's no longer considered to be an illness. That's telling that the literature at that point dis is displaying what society thought of certain uh, expressions. And this definition is very telling as well. Let's continue. Um, oh, one thing over here, if you look at these statistics, the vast majority of first exposures are accidental. 
the vast majority of first explosions are accidental. They're not gone through a very um, and there's there's very little proof to show the first exposure uh, is uh, is actually intentional. It comes through uh, 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 other means to expose via a friend who says, "Look at what I'm looking at," or a colleague, or something shows up that shouldn't have showed up, or they click on links that didn't they didn't know where it's going to lead them towards. It's not actually uh, very much a a, um, a uh, an intentional thing. Okay, now the evolution of pornography. Pornographic materials have always been present. Look at vases, look at pictures, paintings, inscriptions, engrave engravings within museums. They've always been present. Now, how do we view that to be? We say that pornographic material have always been present based upon our Islamic understanding of pornography, which I'm going to get through into in a moment. Now, the Victorian dilemma refers to the fact that the Victorian period, so if you look at historically speaking, you know, there's the Renaissance, there's the Romantic period, there's the Victorian period, in these modes of expression and writing, the Victorians were very strict. They were very much by the book. They did not believe like the romantics of the expression of the soul and romance and love and all of these things. They're very, they're, they're more puritanical in their expression, if you want to put it that way. They're very restricted in their expression. And what they began to do is they began to unearth and discover, in the name of research and knowledge, a lot of uh, materials, a lot of art that depicted people of the past uh, in, in situations being unclothed, where they were disrobed. And this was a big dilemma for them, because they felt that the pure way of existence meant that you remain robed and covered. But now they saw the people of the past also were disrobed. Now, for us, it's not a dilemma. For us, it's not a dilemma because of the, the third point. We don't follow man-made code. Our code is not a man-made moral code. If someone says, because you don't shake the hand of an opposite gender co co-worker, you have violated a moral code or a moral, uh, an ethical code or a code of conduct within the wor workplace, we say that we follow a higher code, a divine code, that prohibits the physical touching between two genders that are not related, uh, directly related, nor married. If someone says, by you lowering your gaze, you are now causing someone to feel less worthy of your attention than another human being, and subsequently you are lowering them and you're belittling them, we say that we're not following a man-made moral code. We're, finding, we're following a divine moral code where these restrictions have been placed for a betterment and a long-term betterment. So in the short term, there might be awkwardness. In the long term, it's not there. And just while we're on this, uh, this, this, this point over here, sometimes when living in the West, people begin to assume that the Western way of life is the global way of life. And yes, we are a global village now, but the Western way of life is still the Western way of life. You can go to places across the world that are not Muslim, that do not have people engaging in interactions and speech the way we do today. And even the Western way, you have to put a little bit of an asterisk over there. Because the 1900s, with a century ago, the Western way of interaction, when you read people like Naomi Wolf and others, uh, you see that their way of interaction was not governed by the moral dictates of today. Rather, they lowered their gaze. If a man looked at a woman, he was actually beaten up by other people who saw this because it was a vulgar act in public to catch the glance of a, 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 of a person of the opposite gender and maintain that glance. Uh, if a woman exposed above her calf or above her knee, she was arrested for indecent exposure. Nowadays, people just hope that the person at least covers below their knees. Speaking about women over here, men, I mean, also follow these types of norms. So this normative uh, stance on life is very subjective. And it's subjective to certain incidents that occur. And I'll give one clear example. When I was younger, there was a president known as Bill Clinton. <clears throat> and <coughs> excuse me, he was involved in an extramarital affair that was highlighted in something called the Star Report. Before that was highlighted, there was a certain type of language 
that was accepted amongst reporters when uh, reporting about an incident. After that star report was, ex was published and, and exposed to the people, because of the inappropriate content there, certain language had to be used. Once that language was used, the reporters never went back. The journalists never went back because they created, they crossed that threshold and they created a new boundary. And that's how human beings are. Once we cross a boundary, it's hard to retrace our steps. It's very hard to retrace our steps. Take a child who lies for the first time. A child who lies for the first time in his or her life will begin to have palpitations, break out in a sweat, begin to stammer, look very awkward. But after that first fib, that first lie, they become more comfortable. And then children who lie after that, it's, you can't even tell the difference. They speak with such fluency and such a stoic ex expression. A person thinks, wow, this person's saying the truth when they're not. Why? Because they, they've crossed a certain threshold and line. And now going back is not really an option, and they've become accustomed, and they've set a new line around themselves. That's what man-made moral codes are. They're restricted. There's no restriction there. They're very subjective, and they're subject to the situation that exists in society today. So a person can push the limits, whereas a divine moral code is already set. You can't push it too far. Now, the Islamic view of pornography comes in a few verses of Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I placed the Arabic there so you can look at the Arabic. He says in the Quran to tell the believing men to lower from their gaze. Min abusadihim. Now, some of the ulama said this, this might be min uh, such that you lower part of your gaze. And so this does not mean that when you see a female for a male, you turn your back and begin to run. You know, you don't turn away such. You, you, you take your eyes and turn them away. The entire body doesn't have to turn. Or you turn away your eyes such that you're still able to function. So you're walking down the street and a female sees a male, a male sees a female, someone with, uh, in front of you. Then you sort of, if you close your eyes and continue walking, you'll hit something. So men of Saudi, you sort of turn away. But you continue your gaze in a direction where you can function and you're not going to cause yourself spiritual harm. And then what does Allah Ta'ala say? And they guard their private parts. And then the second verse, tell the believing women to guard, to lower their gaze and guard their private parts. And then one more thing, and not to expose their beauty or their ornaments. Now what does Allah Ta'ala say? ذَلِكَ أَزْكَانَهُمْ This is pure for them. This is pure for them. So this is not speaking about a physical change. If a person doesn't lower their gaze, there are physical things that occur. But this is speaking about even a spiritual way. And this is why pornography, Islamically, is looked through a different lens. And I'm going to get to that very shortly. Sorry, it should be for them, not fro them. Um, so it's how the believing men to lower their gaze and guard their private parts. Now look at the order Allah Ta'ala says. Tell the believing men to lower their gaze and guard their private parts. And the women as well. Why? Because if a person doesn't lower their gaze, or people don't lower their gaze, they're going to go down a path where they expose themselves to acts in which they compromise their chastity. So the first step is lowering the gaze. The second step is what? What follows by, by not lowering the gaze. If a person does not lower the gaze, then they will not guard their chastity. If they do lower their gaze, they will guard their chastity. Now people say, well, I'm not committing zina. The Quran doesn't speak about not fornicating. The Quran speaks about something greater. And for the women, because men are more visually stimulated than women, and some people say, well, that's not true, brother. You know, you're making these archaic statements. Well, I'm going to use my proof, not from Quran, not from Hadith, not from uh, prophetic statements, not from the statements of our Salaf al-Salihin. I'm going to use our, our um, the, the statements, uh, uh, my proof from media today, from media today. I don't watch TV, but I've been told that there are TV shows and programs. And when I was younger, I can remember this for sure. Where you see a husband and wife, and the wife is absolutely beautiful. And the husband is overweight. He might be thinning in his hair, balding slightly. And you're thinking, how did she marry him? 
And a person can say, well, she was very attractive. That's why he wanted to marry her. Well, that makes sense. But what was attractive about him? Oh, his personality, his laugh, his humor brought this attention. This doesn't mean women are not, um, do not have the right to look for beauty within their spouse. That's absolutely permissible. It's encouraged. But women, Allah Ta'ala gave them a certain forbearance that they look beyond, de uh, not defects, but certain quote-unquote flaws that physically exist that men sometimes don't look beyond. It's actually a defect within ourselves that we can't look beyond that. But Allah Ta'ala says for the women, lower your gaze as well. Because if you don't, you're not going to guard your chastity. And don't expose your beauty. Because if you expose your beauty, it's going to become a cycle. Oh, hold on, let me one more thing. So what's the Islamic view of pornography? The Islamic view of pornography is the exposure of that which is impermissible to glance upon. The exposure of that which is impermissible to glance upon. What does that mean? According to Hadith, for the female, that her face, her hands, and her feet can be exposed. That could be glanced upon. The glance cannot be maintained. That can be glanced upon. Okay? And for the male, what can be exposed, although if you look at the, the Prophet, that wasn't his way of life, uh, he did dress this way when the need was there, and then when he was able to cover more, he did. Now from the navel to the knees must be covered. The navel to the knees must be covered. And there's discussions about this as well, and I, we don't have time to go into those discussions. But that's considered pornography. Now, someone might say, brother, that's not pornography. Well, that's how Islam looks at it. If you look at something called softcore pornography, softcore pornography had a certain type of evolution. Softcore pornography today is similar to advertisements that show undergarments that are sent in any type of uh, newspaper to the houses through the mail. No one stands up and declares, how could someone send pornography to my home? But the advertisements that show uh, undergarment sales in the household, and not even those that are very racy, just regular Target, Walmart brand papers that come to the home with those you know, coupons, etc. Those advertisements are considered pornographic Islamically. They're also considered porn pornographic in view of the first uh, softcore pornography that was sold within our markets. But then the moral code of mankind, it be, you know, it's subjective. So as the lines began to be crossed, more was exposed. So Islam sets a very detailed and rigid line. Men cannot expose navel to knees around women nor around men. Women cannot expose beyond their face, their hands, and their feet around men. And some of the scholars say the face must be covered as well. And there's a discussion about that. And then around women, they can also not expose navel to knees. They also cannot expose navel to knees. So when people say, brother, I'm just watching swimming for the Olympics because it's sport, we respond by saying, brother, you're watching, or sister, you're watching pornography. Because you've exposed, you've exposed more. Now, the definition of pornography, going back to it, is what? It's what? It's subjects, the exhibition of intimate subjects or activity. So it doesn't have to only be activity. We've gone down a very gross line to think it has to be intimate activity that occurs within what we consider a marital a relationship. No. It's the exposure of individuals in that situation as well. And that includes the undress of a person. When a person undresses, there's a certain level of intimacy that takes place. This is why the sunnah of undressing occurs be behind closed doors. And, in, and the other of it is that you squat down such that you don't expose yourself. Okay. Now let's continue. Now, pornography in the brain. Pornography has a very interesting effect on the brain. Pornography is known as a gateway drug. Now, people want to say, well, marijuana is a gateway drug. Yes. What's a gateway drug? A gateway drug is that type of drug that is often given for free at first. And when it's given for free, someone consumes it. Whatever process of consumption takes place, they consume it. And when they consume it, they begin to experience a certain uh, output. They have an experience that they enjoy. 
that enjoyment uh, releases certain, uh, um, you know, certain, uh, certain um, chemicals within the mind. There's, a, there's, there's an enjoyment that takes place. That enjoyment now gets locked within that memory where that uh, chemical release and, that, and, that, and that, that physical enjoyment gets locked in the memory, and then they want to go back for more. Once the brain tries to balance out, once the brain tries to balance out um, what happens in that certain interaction, then the body needs more. So a person comes, he goes, or she goes, they purchase what? They purchase uh, marijuana. They take marijuana. This marijuana is consumed. Upon consume, consumption, the certain level of, uh, 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 of, um, uh, of uh, a chemical release that takes place. When this chemical release takes place, what happens is the body remembers this, the brain remembers this enjoyment, these good feelings, the dopamine and the oxytocin over here, this release that occurs. When the release that's, uh, that occurs over here takes place, the memory then traps that in. Then, the next time this marijuana is consumed, because there cannot be, the brain has a balancing system, there cannot be a huge influx of all of these, uh, of all this chemical release from the brain, there cannot be a huge release. There has to be a, a maintained balance. The same experience is not is not granted. Why? Because the brain has sort of blocked it out, and there's a balance that takes place. So a person has to take more marijuana. Then they can have a similar rush. But then the brain tries to balance that out again. So more marijuana is taken. Then there's a balancing out again. Until marijuana is not doing it anymore, a person goes to harder drugs, crack cocaine, they, they go to heroin, etc. They go down this path to get that release again. Interestingly enough, most drug dealers will give what? They'll give the first drug for free because they know a person will go down that path. It's a gateway drug. Pornography is a gateway drug. It's a gateway drug. And a person consumes pornography, and when they consume it, there's a certain, the dopamine, the oxytocin, was specifically mentioned, other things. There's a good feeling. There's an enjoyment. There's a stimulation. The brain captures that memory. Once it captures that memory, it takes note that upon these type of visual stimuli, I had this good feeling. So then what happens, the person returns back to it. When they return back to it, what do they do? They try to uh, digest or consume that same amount. They try to view those same things. It's not causing that excitement. Why? Because the brain balance is taking place. The desensitization is taking place. There's a balance within the brain. So they have to consume more, consume more, consume more to begin to go down uh, to, to receive that same type of enjoyment. In, marijuana, in the case of drugs, you have to go for marijuana, you have to go to cocaine, you have to go to heroin, you have to go down this certain path. When it comes to uh, pornography, a person begins to involve themselves in deviant behavior, where they turn their attention away from what we consider to be normal, attraction towards the opposite gender, and they begin to take it towards attraction towards things that are very different, including the same gender, including, um, and I have to, I don't I apologize for being a bit explicit, including um, animals, including painful representations, rape scenes. And then this begins to release that type of, um, what? That type of, um, that type of uh, um, uh, chemical release in the brain to produce enjoyment. Now you tell me, if a person is beginning to view violent scenes, pornographic scenes, that display and depict rape and pain, and their brain is now sending out signals of enjoyment, and now they're becoming desensitized to it. Will this person be more likely to commit uh, abuse and aggression within society, or a person who's never been exposed to that, to that type of literature or that type of media before? The answer is obvious. In fact, in a 2011 Newsweek article, it, the, up to 70% of men, uh, there's a higher reporting of 70% of men who viewed pornographic materials. They were likely to have no problem with the act of rape had it not been 
for the legal ramifications that come with it. Not the moral ramifications, not the pain that's involved, not the complete uh, uh, you know, usurpation of chastity of, a, of an individual or the violation of her rights, but the legal ramifications that were there. So pornography is definitely considered to be a type of drug. Now, pornography has some very horrific uh, re uh, uh, ramifications in our lives. Now, I'm going to take it the opposite way. Now, the question we have to ask ourselves is, is the sacrifice worth it? Now, if you look at the, 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 the furthest reaching from the concentric circles, it's about our world. The outlook on the world begins to change. Now, why? We spoke about sort of the chemical balance and imbalance that has to occur, and then the idea of desensitization. In many studies, and I've cited some of these things at the end in the, in, in the bibliography page, so you'll see them. In many studies, we see that deviant behavior, by deviant, I mean deviant intimate or deviant, mm, deviant sexual behavior. Um, consumers, and here I mean consumer uh, through the, the meaning of not someone who consumes visually, rather someone who pays for it. Consumers who consume deviant behavior also walk down the path of prostitution. They attempt to legalize prostitution. They justify prostitution. They're involved in crimes, in abuse. Now, people say, well, that's not true. There are studies that show that people who view pornography are less likely to commit rape. Yes, there's defense of that argument as well. And the defense of it is that people have this type of a need, and then so they sort of fulfill that need through what? Uh, through um, uh, pornography. And subsequently, they, they don't go out and abuse people. But that's looking at it in a very narrow-minded view. Yes, this man, and I'm using men as an example here more, because the pornography definitely directly affects women. But the greater impact thus far has been on men. And two, since I'm a male speaking, I'm using the term male as well. So don't think, women, you're, you're in the clear. Everything has sort of an inverse or converse uh, reality, too. So men, let's take this example that, you know, the, the, uh, the rate might have decreased by 7% or 5% in, such, in some statistics uh, due to, um, due to uh, por pornography that's present. Well, there's always the idea that not all rape is, you know, not all rape is reported. That's one. And someone might say that's a poor argument, but the reality is there's a good percentage of rape that, that, that occurs in date rape, and we don't, we don't obviously uh, encourage dating either. But date rape, there's this whole concept of date rape, and within date rape, many women feel like prudes, and they feel uh, subpar to other quote-unquote liberal women and free women who are willing to also view pornography or be involved in prostitution, etc. And so what they, they don't want to report it. It's a social study on this, that they don't want to report it. Why? Because there's a fear that they also will be looked lower by their boyfriend, etc. And so they just stay quiet with all of this. Now, anyway, let's go back to this. So the male says, okay, there's 5 to 7% uh, less rate that's being reported. Granted, I give you that. In exchange for the 5 to 7% less rape upon the streets, there's been a catastrophic increase in child trafficking, in child trafficking, we shouldn't assume the Philippines, we shouldn't assume South America. In one of the reports I was reading, in Boston, you can find prostitution, underground obviously, of children with relative ease if you know the right places to, to, to look. Now, where does this occur? The vast majority occurs through, one, uh, mothers or fathers who are involved in, in gross financial situations where they're desperate, and that desperate, desperation usually comes through their involvement in some sort of, uh, in some sort of uh, drug or narcotic. Or two, they were stolen away from their families, and now they are prostituted on the streets. So yes, fewer adults are being raped, but more children are being trafficked. Yes, fewer adults are being raped, but more women and some men are finding the need to subjugate themselves to such a situation in their lives where they want to commit suicide, where they feel they have no more self-worth, where they literally have to go into this, this, uh, this state, and there's a whole description about it, where they separate themselves from their body while they're prostituting themselves. So that same uh, rape that didn't take place, that woman is being raped regularly. She doesn't want to be there. 
But there's a need that grew. And she has to fulfill that need to survive. I mean, we're talking about patching up holes in society rather than what? Rather than trying to cure society holistically. Now, there are other areas that pornography is destroying our relationships outside of the world, or within the world. There's relationship, there's direct reports that I was reading about of men who say that now every woman I see, and there's women who are actually, the term was used as sex addicts, they become addicted to this intimacy. But even intimacy is a bad word because intimacy usually refers to some sort of, um, it refers to some sort of uh, consensual activity through something, you know, it's safeguarded. Something that marriage would sort of uphold. Now we have things called hookups that are very different than being intimate. Intimacy has a level of spirituality, a level of love. Hookups and um, these activities, they're very much just physical. It just pushes the carnal self. It doesn't push the spiritual self for growth. So now men begin to look at women and they begin to, they're ogling. You know, when I was younger, if you had to purchase some type of these materials, you had to go where? You had to go to a very strange rundown store where all the windows were covered with black paper, and it was in a part of town that no one really went to. There weren't much lights in the street, and there's a small sign, but people knew to go there. Now you have billboards. You have these stores that have lights, neon lights. They're open to the public to come in. There's no more embarrassment and shame. And the Prophet them said, for the person that the person does not have haya anymore, if uh, alma shit, do whatever you wish to do. Because once you, you, you lose haya, and this is a direct effect of pornography, then do whatever you will because nothing's going to hold you back anymore. And so, uh, do whatever you wish to do because what's going to hold you back now? Haya is the goodness of everything. Every goodness lies within haya, both interpretations that are taken. So within the world, this lack of haya is causing a lot of problems. People are not viewing the opposite gender or the same gender, whatever the case may be, in a light of being human anymore. They're looking at them sort of as a scorecard. They're looking at them for other intentions rather than having normal interactions with people. Then within our uh, children, many children do stumble upon the books. And, you know, uh, I remember one of my friends, I'm not going to mention his name, when I was in my mid-teens, he told me he stumbled upon a, a box, and his father was the president of his masjid, or a vice president, one of the two, president or vice president of his masjid. He stumbled upon a box of pornographic magazines stored in his, uh, in his, um, in his closet. He said, I, I lost respect for my father since that day. I've never been able to respect my father after that day. And can you imagine the hurt that took place of this child who sees his father being the leader of a masjid, married, they have X amount of kids, plural, and he has these magazines. And the child stumbled. Can you imagine how crushing that was? He lost his father that day. Yes, his father's still alive, but he lost his father that day. Now this is another man who lives in the house with him, or now he's, not, he's older now, but there's just another man in his house. And when I would speak to him just about the family, he would never even speak about his father. It was as if this person doesn't exist anymore. There are very severe ramifications and repercussions that come with these things being in the household. Our spouse, many men don't even consider this adultery. Adultery would be what we consider to be zina. Men and women would consider their spouse cheating on other, uh, uh, being intimate with another individual, either through words or more. They would consider that to be what? Cheating. But the person can sit there with a the computer and watch intimacy. And only 18% men, uh, of men consider that adultery. Now, you tell me what type of relationship, what type of trust there'll be within a relationship where the husband or the wife can do this and expect everything to be okay. There's nothing left. And then with Allah, the Prophet ﷺ said, Ana ghayur, wallahu aghyaru minni. I have a lot of ghayra, I have a lot of honor. Ghayra is this, this type of feeling. Some people call it jealousy. Like if a man looks at my wife, I will react unhappily because of my ghayra. 
nowadays men say, you know, I've seen this before. Oh, oh, this is my wife. Why are you introducing me to your wife? Oh, come meet my wife. A man will say, you know, you know, this is this was never the way of our salaf. They didn't they didn't do that. Even they would even say you read the ahadith of Aisha the Allah Huna, she spoke to her brother Abdurrahman the Allah Huna, she didn't even mention go to your wife. She would always use the term ahl, your family. Because the term of Zoj was a very intimate term. And wife and husband, there's a level of intimacy there. So you see some people they'll say, Well, how's your family doing? Or they'll, uh, you know, a husband will receive a text and he'll tell his friend that, oh, my wife said that your family wants to contact you. Now, what do they mean by family? They mean wife. But because of the level of respect and modesty and people say, well, brother, you're being extreme. Okay, fine, I'm being extreme. But it's better to err on the side of caution. Because if you're on the side of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of modesty and you slip up, at least you'll slip into modesty. Well, if you're barely walking the edge of modesty and you slip up, you fall out of modesty completely. When the when the teenagers are speaking, they say, "Oh, so we're we're not we're not actually committing zina. We're just you know we're not doing the actual act." Well, you're tinkering on the edge. If you slip and fall, you fall into zina. So Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, Allahu aghiru minni. He has ghira. Do you think? Do I think that that Allah, who has told me to guard my eyes and not to misuse them, and He gifted me these eyes. If you look at, he gifted me these eyes. I did not earn them. I did not purchase them. He gifted for me. He gifted to me these eyes. If I misuse these eyes in this world, on the day of judgment, will he let me use these eyes to see him? Rabbi lima hasharthani a'ma wa qad kuntu basira. That people will rise up on the day of judgment and they'll say, My Lord, why do you raise me blind? When I used to be a seeing person. You know the greatest reward in Jannah. Is the persons within paradise. And Allah unveils himself. And the people of Jannah. Everything in Jannah now is not incomparable to Allah. Why would Allah. If I misuse my eyes. In the Islamic definition of pornography. Not the western definition of pornography. Why would he let me un uh, use these eyes to see my day judgment. We have to know a lot is at stake over here. A lot is at stake. Children feel like they don't have fathers anymore. Wives feel like they don't have husbands anymore. Husbands question what their wives do when the husbands leave the house. They have this worry now because they know that their wife is looking on these things on the screen. Is she hooking up with someone? I mean, there's a whole... Uh, the, and, and, and the society, every, the society has a hierarchy. The house has a hierarchy. The house of small little representations of general society. If the small representations are falling apart, the entire structure of society will crumble. And then how could we in, in, inevitably expect to see Allah with these eyes? Now, can pornography be considered adultery? Let's look at the term of adultery Islamically. The Prophet ﷺ said, Al-aynani zinahuma an the two eyes. So Allah Ta'ala has there's the Allah has written other types of uh, zina to occur. The hadith begins with that. And then the hadith says the zina of the eyes, the fornica fornication of the eyes, is what that they look at that which they should not look at. Now, uh, the lustful look is mentioned here. I should have erased that as well. It's actually the look. Because some people say, Well, brother, I don't I, I, I'm not attracted to her, so I can look at her. Nowhere did Allah Ta'ala say, tell the believing men to lower the gaze from attractive women. Brother, I'm not attracted to him, so I can look at him. Nowhere did Allah Ta'ala say, tell the believing women to lower their gaze if you're attracted to him, etc. That never existed before and does not exist today. The opposite gender is whom we lower our gaze to. If you look at statistics on workplace affairs, the vast majority of workplace affairs do not begin with, with someone who there was a direct, intense physical attraction. Rather, they were just friends, but that grew into more. That grew into more. So, al aynani zinahuma another. The zina, the fornication of the eyes, is what the improper look. Well, uzanani and the two ears, they're a zinahuma, zinahuma al istinta al istima. That the 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 zina of the two ears is what to listen. Brother, I'm not looking. I'm just calling these hotlines. It's, it's also zina. 
Brother, I just talked to her on the phone. That's also zina. Brother, I'm just texting. That's also zina. That's also zina. And if you if a person says it's not zina, tell me if the Prophet was here, would you say, Oh Master Nirvala, look, look at my text, look what I'm telling her, look what I'm telling him? No one would do that. No one would do that. Wallisan and the tongue. Zinahu al kalam. The the speaking. And now speaking, we can also uh, you know apply this to text messaging. Forget about sexting, per, forget about selfies and belfies. I don't know if there's a Nelfie out there, but there's belfies. Forget about all those things that exist today. This is just speaking about talking. But the whole line of communication is there. And we have to begin to consider how much haya have we lost. You know, one of my teachers had mentioned when texting first came into the fad, 2004. He said that this is going to become an addiction. And he was right. But this addiction has led to certain things that are just horrific. The mind cannot fathom. You know, I fear what type of spouses will my children be and what type of spouses will they marry if Allah blesses them with marriage. Because people now, the line has been drawn so low. And the hadith is clear that the, towards the end of time, the best of man is that individual who he or she sees people fornicating on the street. The best person is the one who has enough courage to go say, go do this on the side somewhere. Walyadu. Yes. That the hand, its zina is grabbing or touching. And the feet, zina, uh, um, um, the, it, it's, uh, it's, for, it's fornication is what? Taking steps towards something. Walking towards something that's going to lead you. And then the heart, وَالْقَلْبُ يَهْوِي it uh it, it it desires and has tamanna for these things, and then what does the tasdiq of this? Why you sadiqu dhalika al farj, or you kadibuhu? All of these things, in the end, the private parts will affirm or dis uh not disaffirm but uh they will approve or disapprove as this translation says over here. What does that mean? That the eyes, that all of these things are small forms of zina, and the private part does the large part of the zina. But it's still considered adultery. It's still a type of fornication. It's still a type of cheating. But the greatest one occurs through the actual act. The eyes might slip, the ears might slip, the tongue might slip, the hand might slip, the feet might slip, the heart might incline. In the end, that person saves himself or herself, does stoba, they can return back. However, when a person slips all the way to zina, then what happens is the, 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 the actual act, the private parts, they've affirmed the zina of all the previous, meaning they've taken it to the final level. They've made it a complete zina. Now, if you look at this next slide over here, look at how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, look at the, the one in red. Allah ta'ala says what? Don't come near fornication. Don't come near fornication. There's four places in Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says don't come near something. Four places where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says do not come near something. One says, uh, oh, sorry, I made a mistake over here. I have to fix that. The, the first one is, the, the second one, Okay, yeah, sorry, no, no, no. There's one I took out. It's sukara because that's not applicable anymore. So there's there's five total, four of this dunya. One place in Surah um, Nisa, Allah Ta'ala says, La taqrubu salah wa antum sukara hatta ta'lum ma taqulun. That don't, um, don't uh, approach the prayer until you uh until you uh, while you're drunk until you know what you're saying that's not applicable anymore in the orange Allah in the blue what does Allah say he addresses the same issue la taqrabu mal yatim don't come close to the wealth of the orphan illa billati hi ahsan um except for that one um and then was la taqrabu mal yatim illa billati hi ahsan that both of these what do they refer to they refer to the individual who has wealth of orphans that, that they take care of. 
And the Sahaba were very afraid of this. What would they do was they would be take, given orphans to take care of, and they'd be given their inheritance. And some Sahaba were very afraid of spending that wealth. So they would save that wealth. Because if you spend a little, you spend a little, you spend a little, then eventually you might consume all of it on yourself. So Sahaba would actually cons would spend from themselves until they became poor. Then Allah Ta'ala gave some reprieve and said, no, you can spend on them from their own wealth, but be careful. Another interpretation also is that people try to marry the orphans just for the sake of snatching their wealth and keeping it for themselves. So Allah Ta'ala is very strict about not touching the wealth of the orphan. That's one. And two, he says, Don't come near fornication. The other verse I've mentioned here is where Allah Ta'ala says something very interesting. Allah Ta'ala does not tell Adam and Hawa alayhim as -salam, that, oh Adam and Hawa, la ta'kula hadihi shajara. La ta'kula hadihi shajara. Don't eat from this tree. That's not what Allah Ta'ala said. Allah Ta'ala in paradise said what? La taqraba hadihi shajara. Don't come near this tree. Because if you come near this tree, it's going to be a slippery slope that will lead you to eat from that tree. So the order in that world, in, in Jannah, was don't come near this tree. If you come near it, you'll slip. You'll eat from it and there will be repercussions. In this world, Allah Ta'ala says what? وَلَا تَقْرَضُ zina. Don't come near fornication. Because why? If you come near it, as mentioned over here, through your eyes, through your ears, through your hands, etc., your nose can also commit zina. Our nose can also commit zina. This is why one of the definitions of one of the ways in hadith a zani is a zania is written is she puts uh, attractive perfume on when she goes out of the home so men can sense smell her and then turn towards her. So that person Allah trying to use the same verb and same construct for the people of this world as he did for our parents in paradise. Don't come close to this sin because if you come close to it, you're going to slip down that path. And then what is some interesting hadith that the person who commits zina. While they're committing zina, they're not, there's no iman, there's no Islam for them. They're not Muslim at that moment. And there's various interpretations of hadith, but that's the actual wording. <clears throat> so we know for our parents to remain in paradise, they were told to refrain from coming near certain things. And the way we look at it, for us to return to paradise, to go back to the place of our parents' uh, existence paradise, is what? We can't come close to certain actions. One of them is zina. And one of them is abuse of the orphans and their wealth. So this is how serious it's taken. The other things, Allah Ta'ala says what? Don't commit this. Don't commit that. Don't kill. Don't. He'll mention don't do the actual acts. And then by refraining, we'll enter paradise. But for this particular act, Allah says don't come close if you want to attain paradise, right? Now, if you look at the cycle of pornography, everyone can probably say there's some area that they fall into. There's the fantasizing, there's the obsessing, the substance abuse, here's the actual consumption of the pornographic material, the loss of control, the guilt of use, the leaving of the act, the time that passes, and then the frustration that comes with it before the cycle occurs again. Now, why are there so many victims? The reason why there are so many victims is because between number eight and number one is a small space. That particular space is a representation of the initial inclination. A person cannot fantasize if they have not looked. A person cannot fantasize if they have not seen. A person cannot fantasize if they have not experienced. So that first order of Allah Ta'ala, يَغُضُّ مِنَ بصارهم, To lower your gaze and guard your private pores for the men and women it cuts off number one. Now, a cycle always needs to have links. If you cut off the first link, it's no longer a cycle. You can't start with obsessing if you don't know what you're obsessing over. I can't begin to abuse the pornography if I don't obsess over it. I can't obsess over it if I've never seen it. I can't, if I didn't fantasize over it. I can't fantasize over it if I didn't see it. So this is why one of the remedies is to lower the gaze. That it cuts off that cycle immediately. Now, there's certain problems that come with pornography. There's five in particular I wanted to mention. One is the subjugation and the prostitution that, that occurs from it. I've mentioned the child trafficking. I've mentioned the women who have been subjugated. Those who had to uh, undergo 
some difficult, and you know, there's one interesting interview I was reading of a woman who was put into, she was, um, her mother was a drug addict. And so she would, uh, she would, uh, for lack of a better word, she would prostitute her daughter off since she was young. And there's a huge market for uh, child trafficking. Then when she was around 10 or 12, 12 years old, what they refer to as a pimp, he found her and he said he'll take care of her. And he began to traffic her as well. She was put into jail at 14 for prostitution. She said, I know of no other child abuse that exists in the world other than this child abuse where the victim is thrown into jail. There are prostitutes in jail today who they're victimized and their quote-unquote pimp is able to roam free. She's put in jail as a child. Or because she had to go through some childhood, because she has no food to eat, etc. Pornography does the same thing. These children are stolen. They're made to involve themselves in these acts. They're recorded, etc. It's published. What? If they say no, they'll be killed. If they say no, they'll starve to death. We are feeding that monster. If someone is looking at these type of things, they have to know, or someone might say, well, brother, it's a free world, and this is what we... It's a free world. Definitely. That's Allah's free world. Meaning it's Allah's freedom to do whatever he wants there. We live completely within a moral compass in this society, in this world. If someone says it's a free will, it's fine. Then I can just kill you at this moment. But I can't. I'll go to jail. I might have the death penalty applied. It's a free will. Then you can say ISIS is correct, which it's not, obviously. ISIS is correct. It's a free will. They can do whatever they want to do. No, there's certain inalienable rights. Why is it when the rights that are violated that lead people to suicide, to depression, to you know, cutting themselves, wanting to kill themselves, hating themselves, that's not problematic? And we can feed into that and we can support it? The second thing is desensitization escalation. You know, certain people will say that, brother, I only look at the free stuff online. Well, that it's a gateway drug. Remember, marijuana is free. Some people just stumble across it. They want you to look at the free stuff. That will take you to the harder core stuff that you have to pay. And then there's some interviews I was reading, very interesting. The person said, once I was too embarrassed to ever use my credit card because my name is on there. But once I did it the first time, nothing held me back. I created fake email addresses. Then there's certain men who just tell their wives that, look, I'm doing this. What are you going to do? You want to leave? Go ahead and leave. There are people who I have met, who I have counseled, who said very clearly that they, that they cannot take care of their, hmm, how do you say it? They cannot fulfill their right as a spouse for their other spouse because of the detriment and the harm of pornography and what it caused in their lives. The unrealistic perception of intimacy. There are spouses who just, you know, they want their, their spouse to act like these videos. It's unbecoming of a wife, of a husband to do that. And this is what they're looking for. And how do I know this? Because people ask that question, is this permissible? Is that permissible? And you're thinking, brother, you know, this is, a, this is supposed to be a sacred interaction between the spouses. Self-loathing. Because after watching pornography, the person's left all alone. And whatever re re uh, exists from pornography. And finally, the moral shift in society. How people have just, the compass is way off now. It's way off. It's way off nowadays. And I'll give you one thing. And I'm going to, this is, I'm telling you right now. This shouldn't be an S at the end of ignores. Um, it should be ignore. Um, I, I firmly believe there's a direct link between pornography and homo, homosexuality. And there might be people who are listening who are struggling with the, with the temptation of homosexuality. I'm not saying anything bad about you. But I feel there's a direct link. And why? Because in pornography, in soft core pornography, there was only this, a picture of a person, often not even nude, only scantily clad in dress. In hardcore pornography, there's two people involved. And if a person's watching it, they're seeing the person the same gender. <clears throat> Enough exposure <clears throat> to something makes you get used to it. While, for example, a young uh, adolescent boy might find a, a female's body attractive, they also will find a male's body repulsive, usually. Usually. 
But when they see on pornographic videos two people interacting like that, they see the male as much as they see the female. And now they become desensitized. And the inclination is easy to, to, to get now. And the same applies for women. And this is my own personal thing. I'm not saying I read this anywhere. It's my own personal thing. Now, gender roles, I'm going to wrap up here because I've gone a little over an hour now. So I, I only want to go an hour. So I'm going to wrap up over here. If you look at gender roles, pornography uh, has caused a big problem for women. Now, there's a big feminist push to permit pornography because it's women's choice. But, you know, you have to look at it for a moment. Historically speaking, many women, their roles have become very masculine. But males' roles have not become to the, the area of traditional feminine roles. They have not. They have not. Even the men who stay within the household, many men stay home to play video games. They don't stay home to, to take care of the house like a traditional house would be taken care of. So if you look at pornography, you know, the, 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 the stimulation that occurs, all of these things that occur, you know, um, it's very male-oriented. And so now what ha happens is the market has begun to introduce female pornography to make it more female-friendly. In the end, what's happening is that women are having to become who they really aren't in order to be embraced by this growing feminist push, one. Two, they're also having to be more manly in relationships to be accepted. And if you look at the last thing, the call of equality, um, women are asked to change, but men are not asked to change. And how many men are subjugated into pornography, into, uh, into prostitution? The statistics are very low in comparison to women. Now, one of the sad realities is if you look a little across the world, of the top 10, and this is from 2006 to 2015, Number one, Pakistan, Muslim country. Number two, Egypt, uh, Muslim country. Number three, Vietnam. I don't know the Muslim population there. Number four, Iran, Muslim country. Number five, Morocco, Muslim country. Number six, India, large Muslim population. Number seven, Saudi Arabia, Muslim country. Number eight, Turkey, Muslim country. Nine, Philippines has a decent Muslim population. Ten, Poland, I'm not familiar with. You can say at least seven out of the ten countries have a strong or a dominant Muslim popularity. Uh, Muslim population, excuse me. Muslims are viewing this. Muslims are viewing this. It's very disgusting. It's very frightening to know that Muslims are one of the top perpetrators of this crime in the entire world. A multi-billion dollar industry that is actually outdoing sports. It's actually outdoing sports in the amount of money it makes. And Muslims are one of the main supporters. So what are the practical steps to cutting it out? The first thing here you have to cut out what's You have to cut out these things. If you don't need a laptop, don't have no one should no child should have a laptop. No child should have a smartphone. Oh brother, you're being extreme. Fine, I'm being extreme. I will say it right now. I have a flip phone. It looks like it was made in the nineteen eighties. You know, maybe Zach Morris will be jealous of it, no one else will be. That's fine. I don't care. But I can't view anything on it. I can view text messages. I can view uh, phone numbers. There's not even video games on here. I can't view anything. And I, and, and, I, and I know if I ever have a temptation, if I flip this phone open, I cannot, I can't go to a website on it. Brother, but all of his friends have it. All of his friends are not doing correct things. All of her friends have it. All of her friends are not, I mean... There, before I in Zambia, I was reading about because I'm an educator for 10 years. I was an educator, uh, that's what, that was my profession before I switched fields. There were, there were kindergarten schools that were shut down because children in kindergarten were imitating marital acts on the playground. Five year olds, and what are we saying, oh brother? There's no old brother about this. Well, we say very clearly, we have to cut these things out. If you have a laptop, get rid of it. Use a desktop. If you have a smartphone, get rid of it. Get a flip phone. I'm the, I'm the imam of a masjid. I have students. I have people who need to get in touch with me. I don't use it. I get to my computer. I sit down. I use my computer. Don't have a tablet. The easy care, the easy carry of it is going to be problematic. 
Now, someone might say, I need it for work. Look, there are times where you need it. If you have a computer, sociologists say, where's the best place for the computer? It should be in the kitchen. It should be in the kitchen. I'm going to get into that in the next slide. But right now, cut yourself out. Avoiding, leaving that which is unnecessary. That's what beautifies the deen. All these unnecessary things, you know, if a child is on the computer late into the night, I will guarantee you, I don't care how righteous our children are, they are not only looking at homework. YouTube shows pornographic films. But, oh, but they say, oh, brother, you need to confirm an address. You know how you confirm an age with YouTube? You create a fake email with a fake name. You put your birthday to be young enough, or to be old enough to be over 18 or 18 over. And then what do you do? You just you use that email to log in. That's all you do. That's all you go to these pornographic websites. What do you have to do? I I agree that I am over the age of such and such, and I am able to make a free choice to view this pornographic material. Click. How many children are sitting there? Oh, you know what? I'm not really this age. I don't want Allah to hold me account for lying. If they're at that step of viewing, they're not going to care about lying. Cut this out. My child will hate me. They'll love you in Jannah. They'll love you when their marriage is not falling apart. You know, I'm going to mention one thing right now. I'm going to be a little explicit, so I apologize right now. But so if you have youth or children, I'll give you like half a minute to get them out of the room. When husbands come to me and they say, I'm addicted to pornography, there's always a secondary addiction that they're hiding. And that addiction is of self-stimulation, if you know what I mean. Masturbation, self-stimulation. Through excessive involvement in that action, they tell me they're unable to fulfill the right of their spouse. So then you speak to the wife. And the wife says, yes, he can't fulfill my need. We've been married for X amount of years. Then what happens is that the, you speak to the brother, and the brother says, I'm just not able to. Because for me, it's just a computer that makes me excited. Then you feel about you hear hear about the wife. What did she do? She had to turn her attention to other directions to be able to, uh, quote unquote, receive her right, be it electronically or through another person. These things are not harmless. All of these things, the eyes, the ears, etc., they're called they're called they're pathways into the heart. Whatever fills the heart will direct the body. In the body, there's a piece of flesh. When it is pure and sound, that the entire body will act that way. It will be pure and sound. When it becomes corrupt, the entire body becomes corrupt. It's the heart. If the heart has pornography in it, well, guess what the body is going to act on? Now, there's five... So there's some practical, I'm going to come back to here, but there's, a, there's practical steps on how to use our smart devices. Move the computer into a public area. Sociologists in particular recommend the kitchen, especially for desi families who are always eating, put in the kitchen. And the back of the computer should be facing the wall. The front should be facing where everyone can see them. To apply parental controls, I'm 34. I'm married, alhamdulillah. I'm happily married, alhamdulillah. I have four children, alhamdulillah. I have a parental control on my computer. My wife knows about it. When my wife went out of town once uh, to visit her mom, I put a parental uh, control on her computer as well. What do you do if you're addicted to it or if you have fear? You go tell your spouse, you put the password in, don't let me know the password. That's it. That's it. Establish timings in which the computer can be used in the house. If it's a must, they need to do it more. Take them to the library and let them use it there. Take them to the library and let them use it over there. Many people will be too embarrassed to be looking at things in the library. Minimize the smart device in your possession. Do not always keep them on you. I have my backpack where I keep my things. I keep my phone inside the backpack often. Why? Because if I need it, I have to sift through it. Keep it in places where it's not easily accessible. When you have that urge, don't let your hand grab it right away. Keep it away from you. If you're at home, don't keep it in your pocket. Keep it in the room, etc. And don't take these things in the restroom. 
It's disgusting to use in the restroom, but people using the restroom, it leads to horrible things. Step five is little, uh, you know, it's a little strange, but stay away from music. The Prophet said, Al-Ghina, which refers to music or and or singing. Yumbitul nifaq fil qalbi kama yumbitul ma azara. It causes hypocrisy to grow in the heart, as water causes hypocrisy to grow, with, uh, causes crops to grow within the ground. Why am I saying that when people are involved in music, it takes them towards this? Now, people want to say, well, brother, you're wrong. Look, I was deeply involved in music in my life, and I know I'm not wrong. And if you think I'm wrong, leave it for a month, then come back to it. And tell me if there's not a, a, a big difference. There's a huge difference. You know, in these scenes, it, it, you know, just connect it. What does half of music, three-fourths of music speak about today, if not more? 90% of music speaks about these type of things. What are the music videos about? These types of things. How do the people dress? Are the people dressed? They dress like nuns? No. They dress in a very inappropriate way. Even the Disney Channel, right? These Disney singers like Miley Cyrus, etc. I don't even know who the newer ones are. You know, they dress in such a way. I don't know what father would let their daughter dress that way. What father and mother let their children dress that way? This undress that way. Now, another practical step is having a calendar. I'm a firm believer that we should make the goal for my whole life, I'll never return to it. But some people say that's, that, that, that's too much. So what you should do is, one, you should have a private calendar. And every day um, that you, um, sorry, I know I saved this with the correct wording on it. I don't know why that didn't get saved. I know I saved it. But what I was mentioning is every day that you abstain, cross it out, or use a specific color. I, I know I typed it. I don't know why that didn't save on here. Um, you know, put it in. So, for example, I abstained for five days. They should all be marked in blue. The day I slipped up, then I should mark that in red. And my end goal. So, let's say I I, I aim for the aim for the rest of my life, which should always be our intention. Then, alhamdulillah. If not, if that's too much, and you can aim for shorter goals. But don't kid yourself. I'll aim for one day. No, no, push yourself a little. Aim for a week. Aim for a month, etc. That's your goal. And if you can put, you know, if you see 29 circles in one X, alhamdulillah, 29 out of 30 days, you abstained. And then what do you do? The next, you say, I was able to accomplish pretty much a month. I'm aiming for two months. I'm aiming for one and a half months. I'm aiming for 45 days. Practical steps. Now, there's, when it comes to, uh, so I'm just looking, I have a few more things left, okay. When it comes to uh, other practical steps, um, they're involved in the spiritual steps over here. Four steps to success, spiritual steps. One is perform Toba right away. I know I filled this in properly. I don't know. Moana uh, Hamoud, if you can check your file later to see, did I send you the proper one? Um, I don't know why it didn't save. Um, so perform Toba. And perform Toba is very simple. There's four components for Toba. Uh, to leave the sin completely. To stop the sin, sorry. To stop the sin completely. The second one is to feel true remorse for the sin. The third one is to make a firm intention never to do that sin again. This is if we have sinned against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we have not sinned against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if we sinned against a human being, we stole something, etc., then we do the same three things. And the fourth thing is what? We fulfill that right. We go back, if I stole from that person, I return money back to that person. If I broke that person something, I, I fix it for them, etc. That's how we do Tawbah. Now, when we do Toba, we should recognize the following. I'm doing Toba towards pornography. I have violated a right of Allah and a human being. I've misused the eyes he's given me, and I've looked at a human being a way I should not have. So I should stop the sin. I should feel true remorse. A, 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 a Toba is what? Nadama. It's having remorse. I should promise never to go back again. That's what the calendar mentions. But then how do I fulfill the right that I have, uh, that I have heard? begin to donate towards child trafficking, uh, you know, causes that help stop that act, um, begin to help people who are caught in this act, you know, go to youth and just say, you know, at your masjid that I'm sponsoring 10 net nanny computer protection uh, programs, whoever wants it to come to you, I will pay for it. That's how you're refulfilling it because you're helping others not abuse their rights. The other thing I mentioned was make make dua. Dua is a huge gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's the weapon of a believer. Make dua. Let the cheers roll. Keep good company. Not many people will sit with other people who are righteous and look at these type of things. And finally, perform dhikr. 
perform dhikr refers to what? Have such a access of dhikr in your life. Uthkurullah has dhikran kathira. Uthkurullah has dhikran kathira. Remember Allah Ta'ala, great remembrance. Now why? Because you remember Allah, it fills the heart with His remembrance and His love. There's an interesting uh, principle that's mentioned in uh, in, in Quran. The Allah Ta'ala says, إِذَا لَقِيْتُمْ فِيَةً فَثْبُتُ When you meet the opposing army, become firm. وَذْكُرُ اللَّهِ كَثِيرًا And remember Allah greatly. What does that mean? When you meet the army in the battlefield and you feel frightened at that moment, become firm by remembering Allah. Remembrance of Allah makes you firm. So the moment a person is going to fall into this act, Begin to remember Allah. Some people say, well, brother, I can say subhanAllah and I still look at it. That's true. That's but it hasn't reached the level of dhikr yet. It's just verbal. It hasn't reached the heart yet. So begin to make a person, be a person who makes that dhikr reach their heart. And there are trained people out there with whom you can connect yourself to be able to benefit from that. But do a lot of dhikr, such a lot of la ilaha illallah. Because that purifies, that, that, that purges the heart free from these different desires. Now, when you recognize a spiritual disease, this particular one of pornography is lust. So when it comes to diseases, we should recognize what? That one, dhikr is a huge cure for diseases. But also, lust, um, lust you can identify lust based upon symptoms. Like when a person is running up the stairs and gets short of breath or has chest pains, that's a symptom. The symptom is what? Indicative of something greater, maybe a heart disease, etc. Sorry, Mon, I don't know why. That's my mistake. I was working on both at the same time. Uh, the one that you sent me, and I was cut and pasting. And I don't think I cut and paste everything in. But anyway, if anyone wants this, I can go and cut and paste and send the complete copy later. But whatever, alhamdulillah. So identify. Look at the symptoms. If someone's saying, well, I just talk to people, that could be a symptom of lust. And a doctor is able to recognize symptoms better than we are. Thus, go to a doctor of the heart, a spiritual doctor, and ask them. Go to our Mashaikh and ask them. Someone says, Brother, I, I, I have no, I have no uh, symptoms of lust. Really? Okay, well, how are you with your wife at home? Well, we have a decent relationship. We fight a lot. Well, how are you at work? Oh, I'm fine. My nurses think I'm a great doctor. That's a symptom. When you can direct toward someone you're not married, good character, but not towards your own spouse. You know, the, the, the wife is a lawyer. How are you with your other lawyers? I'm very, very kind. How are you at home? Oh, my husband, I don't like him too much. I, I'm very mean to him. All my court skills come out of the house, you know, at that moment. Rebuttal after rebuttal. These are symptoms and signs. It's hard for us to tell. People think pornography is the only sign. Pornography is not the only sign. There are other signs as well. So you have to identify the signs. They don't have to diagnose the signs. Sometimes for some people, diagnosing the diagnosis of a sign is not as easy. The, the diagnostic process is such that you have to know what it refers to. So is pornography a sign of lust? Yes, it can be. But overeating can be a sign of lust as well. Overeating can be a sign of lust as well. So a person goes to a sheikh and says, I, I'm, I, don't, I lower my gaze really well. But then the sheikh asks, how's your eating? Oh, I eat a lot. That's a sign of lust. It just hasn't turned into uh, affecting the eyes yet. We have to treat the symptoms, and that's usually through the zikr. You have to monitor it. Look, no person can ever remove a spiritual disease. You can only have control of it. Think of a spiritual disease like a physical disease. If I have asthma, I can't get rid of the asthma. But I can make it dormant enough that if I can control the environmental factors, it won't, uh, it won't, I won't react to certain things and I won't, be able to, I won't have the attack anymore. Then if I have the attack and I take the inhaler and it gets fixed, I protect myself from the environmental factors. In that same regard, you can monitor it, and someone should be helping you monitor it. You can't just monitor it on your own. The monitoring has to occur through a second set of eyes. Remember one time with my, I'll give you an example of my own life. Remember my, my sheikh told me very clearly, you cannot speak anymore. I was told to stop giving speeches. And I was thinking, man, what is this guy doing? You know, people are inviting me from everywhere. And I, and I, and I was thinking these thoughts. And I'm benefiting people. And, you know, I'm at the peak of my game. These are the thoughts I was thinking. But I didn't think anything was wrong with it. But I decided to listen to my sheikh and do what he said. I stopped speaking. For two years, I wasn't speaking. Meaning like giving speeches. I was speaking to people. I wasn't giving speeches. Then one day, I was sitting in a speech. You know, sitting in the speech, I was sitting and I was thinking, man, this person's content is great, but his delivery is off. I could do so much of a better job. And at that moment, I'm like, oh, subhanAllah. 
that's the disease he wanted me to see. That's the pride I have that was sort of covered before and I wasn't recognizing it before. And that you need a second pair of eyes to look at to help monitor that disease. Now, to remove this disease, first one is eat and drink less. The Prophet ﷺ told us to, that if you, to marry. If you cannot marry, to what? To fast, because of protections, a shield. Also, how do the Prophet recommend us to eat? The believer eats one-seventh of the disbeliever. What else do we know? That the worst vessel to feed, to fill, is the son of Adam. Look at in Ramadan. In Ramadan, what happens? We eat little, we drink little, and we also have a, 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 a little marital relations. Now, the eating little and drinking little causes a person to have less desire. It, now, what? Now that doesn't mean, okay, I'm going to fast every Monday, Thursday. No, no, no. If you have this disease, you fast every day. Parents, if you're listening, if your son or child asks you to fast every day, let them do it. Oh, brother, you're being extreme. Yes, but the hellfire. Naru ashaddu harra. The hellfire is more extreme in its heat. That's what the Quran says. Let your child fast every day. They're not going to die. They won't. Why? Because that no person will die except that Allah has already ordained it. Let them fast every day. Let them crush this. If not, you will have to, not inshallah, you won't. But we face the, the sob stories that I have to face on a regular basis. So let them eat or drink less. Eat and drink less four or five days straight. And when you, fat, when you fast, break it with very little, dates and water, just water, for two or three days straight. Then have a normal meal one day. Then for four days straight, uh, only water. Then, then have a normal meal. Then maybe for a couple days fast. But they should be consecutive fast. That crushes the nafs. Step two, lower our gaze. And I mentioned so much about this earlier. And be excessive in dhikr. When we purge our heart of remembrance of Allah and put in our heart remembrance of Allah, it helps us subsequently conquer this. Now finally, we cannot be silent about these issues anymore. We have to speak about it as a community. And as a community. I looked at the purifyyourgaze.com Muslim uh, initiated uh, um, uh, effort. Enroll in that. They have three different programs. Enroll in it's a very good program. Fight the new drug. It's a Christian initiative, as uh, uh, but it's also a religious based initiative that helps us fight the new drug, which is what, which is pornography. And then there's the bibliography in the end. This is over here. So I'm going to stop here. I'm going to take questions, and then um, let me just get the join on the screen.